Hello everybody. We are back. I am Tim with Golf Cart Garage. We're back with our weekly Q&A session where we try to answer uh, some questions that people have sent in to Golf Cart Garage. Um, we get lots of questions every week on a daily basis. We'll see if we can help some people out. We'll see if we can save them some money. It is January the 20th, Thursday. We are live right now on Facebook and YouTube at the same time. So let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can help some people out. Let's get started. Number one. I did not use my golf cart for one year and a half due to COVID. Battery was empty. I put two gallons of fresh distilled water and recharged each battery to eight volts for a tested gauge of 48 volts total, but have no power and drain really fast. How could I resolve this problem? Well, here's the here's the the bad news. The bad news is it it's possible that you might not be able to resolve your problem. Uh, two gallons of distilled water that means that tells me that your plates were exposed. The lead plates were exposed in your batteries for I don't know how long. You said you didn't use it for a year and a half, so the plates were exposed for a period of time. They most likely sulfated and may not even be able to recover their self. So in order to, to get an answer to all of your questions about your battery pack, you, what you need to know is the condition of your battery pack as it sits right now. A golf cart shop would have a load tester uh, and not just a, a little load tester, that a handheld load tester that you, that you check one battery at a time. They would have a big machine, it's called a discharge tester and they can discharge your battery pack and answer all your questions about your battery pack condition at that point. That's the best way to tell what condition your entire battery pack is as a whole is with a discharge tester. Uh, most golf cart shops would have that and they're going to charge you for that, but that would be a good way so, so you would know if, you, if your batteries are ruined or even your, if you're wasting your time trying to recover them or not, because they'll be able to give you a, a, a very accurate assessment on how good they are at the present day. So that's what I would do. I would get a proper load test done on your entire battery pack. Okay, let's see. Number two. I have a 1984 Yamaha gas golf cart. Ignition wires were cut and I don't know how to match up the new wiring. The wiring from about 12 inches of the switch is all the way, all the way back to the tail is fine. Well, in 1984, Yamaha is going to be, uh, it's going to be a Yamaha G1. It's going to be a two-stroke uh, in 1984, two-stroke Yamaha G1. Probably, if you ask any, any golf cart mechanic that has worked on a variety of golf carts, Yamaha G1 is probably the best golf cart ever made. And it was Yamaha's first attempt at a golf cart. That's probably the best gas golf cart ever made. They had about a 10 year run there, 79 to 89. Uh, so what you need is a wiring diagram. And because Yamaha G1s are, are considered, they have like a cult following on the internet almost. Uh, there are wiring diagrams readily available all over the internet on the golf cart forums even. You can go to one of the golf cart forums and find a wiring diagram. That's exactly what I would do. Anybody that has a G1 gets old as they are, like the newest one you could possibly have would be 1989. So uh, anyone that has a G1 needs to get a, a, a good wiring diagram. And in your case, especially since you've got cut wires, that's, that's, that's how I would do it. All right, let's see. Number three. My club car will start and run, but will not charge the battery. I have a 2002 DS with Kawasaki FE290. I, I have seen that happen on Kawasaki FE290 before uh, on golf cars. And the first thing that I do, if everything else looks fine, I put, I, I put a voltmeter on the battery itself in the golf car. Take a reading, leave the voltmeter on there, leave the probes on there, crank the car in neutral, because you can crank a club car with FE290 in neutral, uh, crank it in neutral and watch the voltage on the battery. If the voltage stays the same 
R drops if it goes down after the car is cranked and running, then it's most likely the voltage regulator. Uh, I don't automatically jump on the starter generator first as being the problem because it's expensive. So the cheapest thing to jump on is going to be the voltage regulator, and that's the most common failure in, the, in that situation where the battery's not being charged also. So it's most likely your voltage regulator. Let's see, number four. This is from Rick S. I have a 2004 Club Car DS 48 volt. Battery's fully charged, 50.3 volts. At 50 volts back to the controller, cart will not run. 50 volts also going to solenoid, cart won't run. It did move in reverse and forward a few times. Now nothing. What should I look at? Did you tell me, my, my question would be, is the solenoid clicking when you, every time, like when you turn the key on and touch the gas pedal, do you hear the solenoid click? If the car ran, if, or tried to run even, then the solenoid had to have clicked. So if the solenoid is clicking, see, that tells me right there that a whole lot of stuff is working correctly all the way up to that point. Your, your key switch, your, your, your pedal switch, uh, all the wiring all the way to the solenoid. If the solenoid's clicking, that tells me that, that, that everything is cool up to that point. The next thing after the solenoid is the controller. And the, the symptoms that you described, like a cart moving a few feet and then it, or, or even jerking a little bit and in reverse and forward, that can be a symptom of a bad controller. I uh, hate to tell you that because they're kind of expensive, but that's where I would be leaning on that one. Number five, I just spent big bucks for new 12 volt batteries. I'm handicapped and the cart has limited use. Now I want to keep it charged for the winter and have forgotten the routine. What should I do about the charging? Oh, uh, well, if you're gonna leave your car over the winter months, it uh, depends, I need to know about your charger because most likely if you don't have a club car with an onboard computer, then once a charger shuts off, it shuts off and it never comes back on, doesn't do anything. So you, if you don't want to spend any more money, you have to come up with a plan for someone to go over there and charge your cart about once a month is what I'd recommend. Once a month, recharge the golf cart and keep the batteries up, keep the batteries charged that way. If you're willing to spend some money, you can get a, a new charger uh, like the one that we sell at Golf Cart Garage is the Summit 2 charger. It has a, what is called a storage mode function. It's not necessarily, it doesn't act like a trickle charger as much as it is a, it counts a, a certain amount of time and then it comes back on and reassesses your cart and if it needs to, it'll charge it again and then goes back off and then comes back on, does that throughout the winter. Uh, uh, it's designed for exactly what application that you're, that you're needing. So that would be a consideration there. Uh, go to golfcartgarage.com and plug in Summit 2 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Number six. I purchased six new Trojan TH75 batteries in July of 19, 2019. My service vendor says I need to replace them. How can that be true at two years old? Uh, that's two and a half years old right now. That would be odd for a new set of T875s. Uh, it's a very good battery. Uh, two and a half would be odd. I've seen them go out at three and a half and four uh, where they needed to be replaced. But at two and a half, I have questions about uh, how, what was the application they were being used in? I mean, were they being used in a golf cart? Because these are these these batteries are golf cart batteries. I know some a lot of people use them in solar systems and other applications. So I would want to know what application they were being used in and how were they being taken care of? Because two and a half years is pretty quick. So uh, for them to to be needing a replacement. Uh, so I'd I'd have questions about that and the charging system that was used. You know, I'd have questions about that. Number seven, I have a year 2000 club car. I just replaced the batteries a year ago. It runs very slow and I'm wondering if the motor needs replacing. Uh, 
uh, it's very, very unlikely that it's that the motor needs replacing. Uh, electric motors in golf carts, they generally either work or they don't. They don't really have, they don't really lose power over time or lose speed over time. They, if the batteries are good, the batteries put out the voltage, the motor's going to put out the torque and put out the speed that, it, that it's designed, that it's wired to do. Uh, they don't generally lose, lose any power or de they don't generally degrade, I guess would be the, the right word. So uh, my question would be how slow, how slow is slow? You know, uh, what are you saying? Uh, 12 to 14 miles an hour? Because that's, that's uh, generally what golf cars are, are set at for golf course speed is 12 to 14 miles an hour. You know, if it's, if it's slower than it used to be, you know, that's a different story. We could, we could dive into that. It, uh, it's most likely going to be something to do with your potentiometer that, that you're using. It could be needing replacement or could be a need an adjustment. Let's see. Number eight. This is from George. The golf cart has not been used for over one year. Charger was connected during the idle period, but when we returned, the charger was off and the battery's dead. How do I get the batteries charged? Well, most golf carts, you know, like I was saying earlier, when the when the charger charges the golf cart, when they shut off, unless you have a club car between the years 1995 or, or 2014, 48 volt with an onboard computer, the charger is never going to come back on. So most golf carts, you know, the, the Yamahas and Easy Goes, uh, during that time, they their their chargers just shut off, and club car does that now. Is they, well, they got a whole different system now too, but anyway. So when it shuts off, it, 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 just, it just stays off. It's not doing a trickle charge or anything like that. So if your batteries are dead now, that your charger's not gonna come on because your charger is DC activated. So if your batteries are too low on voltage, your charger will not come on. So you have to recharge your batteries. Now, depending on which batteries you have in your car, you, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. If you have four 12 volt batteries in your car, if you have that system, it's relatively easy. You just take an automotive 12 volt charger Put it on deep cycle setting and charge one of your batteries at a time charge that charge them up one at a time uh, now if you have six six volt batteries if your car is a 36 volt car and you have six six volt batteries you can charge you can either get a six volt charger and charge them up one at a time or you can use a 12 volt charger and charge two at a time you would go the positive of one battery and the negative of the battery right beside it if those two batteries are connected together with a cable. The positive of one battery and the negative of the battery right beside it. You know, the one, the, the battery that's connected to it with a cable. That would be a 12 volt connection and that way you could charge two 6 volt batteries at a time. You, you, you do that three times and you'd have all your batteries charged. You do these two, then you go to the next two, and then go to the next two. Do the same thing. Now, if you have six 8-volt batteries, a 48-volt system with six 8-volt batteries, that's where it gets a little, little more complicated. You can still use your 12-volt charger. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get the voltage in your 8-volt battery up as high as you possibly can. Uh, with a 12-volt charger, you could put a 12-volt charger on that 8-volt battery and try to charge it, but do not walk away from it. I mean, you, you're going to have to either set yourself a timer or set yourself a reminder because what you're doing is you're charging an 8-volt battery with a 12-volt charger. That in itself is not recommended, but you really don't have too many choices here. Uh, what I used to do in the golf cart shop, if I had a 48-volt cart that was dead or that was too low to turn the charger on, I could take another 48-volt cart and park it right beside it and run jumper cables from their entire pack to the, to the dead 48-volt then plug the regular charger in. I would just fool that battery pack into thinking that it had battery pack voltage because it sees the voltage from the other cart. And that was what I would do in a golf cart shop. But when you don't have that convenience of having another 48 volt car, you've got to charge up each one of those eight volt batteries up to a certain amount. So you'd put a 12 volt charger on each one of the eight volt batteries, set yourself a reminder for like an 
I don't know, first I, would tr I wouldn't go any more than like uh, 20 minutes and then see what's happening. Come back and monitor the situation, see if the battery's boiling or check the voltage in the battery, see where you're at, just in like 20 minutes. And if, if, the, if the voltage is up, then go to the next one and do the same thing and, and do, put a 20 minute timer for yourself to remind you to go back and check that one also. You don't wanna walk away because if you keep a 12 volt charger on an eight volt battery, you're gonna ruin the battery. Okay, this is number nine. I have a Star EV48. Batteries are fully charged. Turn ignition switch on and nothing happens. What should I check? Well, obviously you're gonna to need to raise the seat and just check all the obvious things. Uh, there's lots of connections in an electric uh, 48 volt car or electric any any electric golf car. There's lots of connections that could be loose, that could be corroded. Uh, some of them could be obvious, some of them are not. Some of them might not be so obvious. Uh, so the first thing, just grab every one of your cables with your hand and see if you can wiggle it. And see if you can find a loose connection on any of your batteries. You know, any of your battery posts or any of your main power wires. Other than that, if uh, you think it possibly is the key, because you say you turn the ignition on and nothing happens, if your batteries are all good, you gotta understand, I'm assuming that your batteries are fine, that your batteries have voltage in them, that, that, your, that your batteries are charged. So other than that, you could uh, learn how to do a continuity test with a voltmeter, and you could ohm out or do a continuity test on the key switch itself. You know, you have to get behind the key switch and take the wires off and then put your your, your uh, voltmeter leads on there and do a continuity test with the key switch just to make sure that that's working. Let's see, number 10. What is the best 12 volt 50 to 60 amp hour lithium battery for a club car precedent conversion? Well, in the last few years, last I don't know, I'd say maybe uh, three to five years. Lithium batteries have uh, become readily available. There's lots of competition out there. There's, there's, there's a lot of them that are available. Prices have come down to a, a reasonable amount to where they were 15 years ago. 15 years ago, it would, you could still do it lithium uh, 15 years ago if you wanted to, but it would just cost them way too much money. And a lot of people think it still costs too much money because it does cost, right now, lithium conversion could be anywhere from uh, 1800 to 2800 depending on how many amp hours you want the the lithium batteries that we sell here at golf car garage are allied that's the that's the ones that we sell allied the way that they do it is kind of different than some of the other people they they give you you've got plenty of choices uh, with allied they can they can sell you let's just say you have a 48 volt car allied can sell you one 48 volt battery just one but it's a real small one. Well, it's not real small, but it's about the size of a 12 volt battery, but it's, it's a 48 volt battery. Now you could just buy one if you wanted to, but that's not gonna give you very much range. So you buy two and you hook them into parallel and that's supposed to be two of them in parallel is supposed to be competitive with a, a regular full golf cart lead acid pack. But you've got so much room, you could put a third one in parallel. You could put a fourth one in parallel and they weigh so much less than the lead acid already, you can get as much range as you as you possibly want it. So they can do it that way, or they can sell you a 12 volt battery and you could buy four of them. And that'd be 48 volts. So they they offer two different, they offer different uh, ways of building your pack. You know, it just depends, depending on how much weight you want to add versus how much range you want to gain. So that's the ones that we sell and uh, I've heard lots of good things about them. Number 11, how do you know what percentage you have discharged your batteries? Is there a corresponding voltage? Uh, um, I think I understand your question. Uh, there, there is a corresponding voltage to the percentage of discharge of your, your battery pack. That's how the the gauges work. That's all they're going off of is the voltage in your battery pack when they tell you what percentage is discharged. So yes, there would be a corresponding voltage. Like in a 
in a six volt battery, let's just say one six volt battery, there's a huge difference between 6.0, like if you, when you put your voltmeter on there and you get 6.0 and 6.37. I know it doesn't sound like a big difference, but that's the difference between dead and fully charged. 6.0 is actually considered dead in a six volt battery. 6.37 just sitting there, you know, is considered fully charged six volt battery. So those gauges, you know, they do work off of, off of different voltages and that's how they're coming up with, you know, what they're going to show you. Uh, I don't like those gauges very much actually, because it's hard for them to be accurate all the time. I, I trust a voltmeter reading much more than I do those gauges. But yes, there, to answer your question, there, there has to be a corresponding voltage to the percentage of discharge because that's how those gauges work. Let's see, number 12. I have a 96 TXT lifted six inches. Do I need an adapter kit along with the Jake's rear disc kit? Uh, we are a dealer for Jake's and they do not, they don't have, Jake's doesn't have rear disc as, as far as I know. They have disc brakes, a di they have a disc brake kit that's designed for the front, but I'm not aware that they have one that's designed for the rear. Uh, and the front uh, goes on, I've, I've had cars with, with the front, they, they, work, they work well. Uh, the, for the rear, the only thing I know of that is available is we sell a mechanical disc, not how to see the front, the, the front disc set that Jake sells is a hydraulic disc set. It actually has a hydraulic cylinder. The, the rear, the rear disc that, that we sell here at golf cart garage is a mechanical disc brake set. It's from a company called Ameritorque and it works very well on lifted cars. So if you need, if you're trying to upgrade your brakes because your car's lifted and has tall tires, you could actually run both of those in conjunction with each other. You could put the Jakes on the front and you could put the Ameritorque on the rear if you, if you really needed to. I definitely recommend the Ameritorque uh, for the rear of a TXT. Uh, I have a lifted TXT myself and it has Ameritorque uh, mechanical disc on the rear. And it works very well, way better than the uh, than the stock. And the reason is, is because the stock is only designed to stop the rolling mass of an 18-inch tire, which is what comes on stock. Anytime you go to bigger tires, you've got a, a much larger rolling mass, and you've got the same size brakes in the, in the, that hub, and it, they, they're just not strong enough to 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 stop the car safely. Let's see here, number 13. I have a 98 Club Car 48 volt DS golf cart. I believe the controller is failing. Battery and battery cables are less than two years old and charge well. Do you have options to upgrade this controller to a high amp controller? The cart has the back seat for two additional riders. I'm happy with the speed, but want more torque. Uh, yeah, that we there are several controllers that you could get uh, to higher amp controller and higher amp is would be have the potential to give you more torque. The first thing I would want to do is make sure everything is right on your car. Make sure it's going wide open, like with your whatever potentiometer you have in use. You need to verify that it's giving the wide, to to go wide open signal to the controller. See, the potentiometer tells the controller what to do. It tells that it tells the controller what to do because it sends that controller some type of signal, and it tells you, you know, it tells it the controller to put out a little bit of power or a medium amount of power or full wide open power to the motor. You need to make sure that when your foot's all the way down, that it's sending the wide open signal to the controller that the controller is going wide open, You're telling the motor to go wide open. Because if it's not, that could be your torque issue. But if it's working correctly and you still need more torque, then yes, we sell several options for a higher amp controller for your car. Uh, and because you're carrying around two people, you must you might be going up hills and stuff. It would probably it, that that should help you. If not, if that's not enough, then we have, we also have combo kits available at Golf Cart Garage that have that come with a new controller and a new torque motor. That would definitely give you new, uh, more torque and solenoid. 
Uh, and the combo kits that we sell, if you'll look on our website, you'll see when you read about them, it, some of them will tell you the percentage of increase in speed. They'll tell you the percentage of increase in torque. They give you a little information so you know, uh, and they tell you the top, the top speed of your car. Uh, they give you a little more information so you'll have an idea of what you're getting. Let's see, number 14. Will low batteries below 45% cause cart not to move? Uh, very, very possible. Uh, I mean, I don't know where you're getting that 45% from, so I, I would want you to, I would want to put a voltmeter on the batteries and see what you mean by 45%. Uh, because, uh, yeah, the low batteries can definitely cause a cart not to move. I just don't know if you're getting that 45% off of one of those gauges or, or what, where you're getting that from. But uh, the that's the first thing, anytime a customer would bring me an electric golf cart, the first thing with any type of symptom whatsoever, the first thing I would do would be eliminate the batteries as being the issue. Like I would test their charger and test their charging system. No matter what the cart was doing, I'd test their charger. I'd always tell them when they were bringing a golf cart to my shop, don't forget your charger. Bring your charger because I want to test your charger. I want to make sure it's working properly. I want to test your batteries, make sure they're accepting the charge properly. And then I can do all my diagnosis on the car, you know, from there. So uh, it's very possible that 45% could cause your car not to move. Let's see. Number 15 is from Ken. Will a new muffler help my 2016 easy go run quieter should i also replace insulation under the seat well if there's if there's not anything wrong with your muffler that that's on there then i would say probably wouldn't help it if you put a new muffler on there. The only reason that it would help it be quieter is if there was something wrong with the one that's on there to begin with. Now, like, you know, if it has a hole in it or it's rusted out on the inside or something like that, uh, uh, could be causing it to be a little bit loud, but golf carts in general are, even gas golf carts are really quiet for, for gas, you know, for combustion engine vehicle. It's very quiet. They're designed to be quiet. So if yours is too loud, there might be something wrong with your muffler. And in that case, it, you know, it would help. Now, as far as the insulation goes, yeah, sure, you could do that. You could put more insulation. That would keep the sound, you know, that, that may dampen the sound a little bit. But, you know, the, the bottom of the golf cart's open, so you're, you're still going to have sound going out there. I've, I've had customers that have wanted to uh, extend the tailpipe. You know, the tailpipe is under the cart. They don't like the fact that it, the tailpipe exits under the cart. And if you drive slow and you don't have airflow, some of the fumes can come up inside the, you know, the, under the, the canopy area where you're sitting in, in the golf cart. They don't really like that. So they had some people that were asking questions about extending that tailpipe a few times. Uh, that may help you too. You, you, you want to find the shortest route though, because that tailpipe is a certain length for a reason. It all has to do with how the engine runs. If you extend it too far, then you might change the way the engine runs and that, that, could, that could damage the engine. But if you want to just maybe route it out the side of the car, that would be something that you could consider and it might not seem as loud, you know, inside the, inside the driving area. Number 16 from Roger. I installed the Mad Jack's three and a half inch lift on my 2014 club car precedent with new 10 inch rims and tires. The A arms rub against the rims when the wheels are turned all the way to the left or right. Is there a fix? Do I need 12 inch rims or do I have the wrong lift kit? Uh, well, I, I looked it up and you definitely do not have the wrong lift kit. You, you've got the correct lift kit for your car. The only thing I noticed in the uh, instructions or the, uh, the notes about it, there's a, there's a special note that says when you mount the spindle on that, on that lift kit, that you need to make sure that the tie rod mount points are facing toward the front. Now, the fact that they have that special note in there tells me that it's possible 
to mount this spindle on that wheel and and and, and the, the, to switch the driver and passenger side spindle and the tie rod ends would mount to the rear so my question would be did you see that note and do you understand what i'm saying are they are they going to the front are this the tie rod mount points on the spindles need to be pointing toward the front that was about the only thing that i saw in the special notes about that lift kit you know that could be that could cause an issue if that was backwards uh Yes, do I think 12 inch rims would work? Yes, I think 12 inch rims would probably solve your problem also. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the cart needing 12 inch rims uh, for that lift kit, uh, but uh, I can understand what you're saying. The 10 inch rim would be hitting it when you, when you turn all the way. If you had a 12 inch rim, it, it, it shouldn't be hitting it. So that would work also. So you're, you're on the right track there, but I would want to know about those spindles. Uh, the, Okay, number 17 from Bart. Regarding the Yamaha Drive Golf Cart Light Kit, street legal, regular, or LED, how much of the wiring needs to be crimped to mate with the basic connections of starter, ignition, and such? Well, Bart, the... the the Yamaha Drive LED or our regular uh, street legal light kit that we sell, it comes with a complete wiring harness. I mean, and when I say complete, it doesn't even incorporate into your wiring harness at all. So it comes with its own wiring harness that everything just plugs in, the blinkers, the headlights, the tail lights just plug into the wiring harness and then there's a power connection, power and the ground connection on the wiring harness that plug into to the battery if you're a gas car or plugs into your voltage reducer if you're an electric car. So you don't you don't have to crimp or, or tie into your existing wiring harness anyway. That's not the way it's designed to be. It's designed to work all with its own products like there's the wiring harness is, is from Red Hawk, the, the lights are from Red Hawk, the, the, everything is, is all one system. So you don't have to tie into your existing wiring. Let's see, number 18 from James. Do these on the fly programmer Novartis controllers, extended link controllers work on a standard 2007 precedent or is Novartis control an aftermarket thing? Well, no, Novartis is an aftermarket thing, so I'm not really sure. It's, it, it's a very good product. Uh, we, we're a dealer for the Novartis system. And as long, it, it, for the club cars, as long as your system is an IQ, then it's a plug and play conversion for, with the, with the uh, Novartis system. Now, that's if you're going to the AC system. It's a, it's a plug and play if you want to go all the way and go to the, uh, the, the Novartis AC conversion system. Your car has to be an IQ system to start with, and you're in luck there because a precedent is an IQ system. A 2007 is an IQ system. So if you wanted to get the AC conversion, Novartis, the, the, the best of the best, then yes, you, you're already set up to go. Number 19, this is from Bill. What is a freedom plug? All right, a freedom plug is a, in an easy go PDS, that's, it's for an easy go PDS only. That's the only car that a freedom plug is for. There's a lot of EasyGo PDS. They made them for a long period of time. Uh, it, and in fact, I'm not even sure they, that the, you can use the, they probably don't even have the plugs in 48 volts. So this is just specifically for 36 volt EasyGo PDS cars. Their controller is adjustable. This is before controllers were adjustable with, uh, you know, computers and uh, being able to plug in and make adjustments. They're, they're adjustable with plugs that you could get. The EasyGo PDS has a uh, four different plugs that you could get. What these plugs do is that they adjust the amount of regenerative braking that the car has, and they adjust the amount of flat ground speed. Like the lowest plug would be called the steep hill plug uh, for the EasyGo PDS. 
With that plugged in, you have maximum regenerative braking and the slowest uh, speed on flat ground. Like when you, when you, with that plug in, when you'd come over the top of the hill and you'd start coasting down the hill, that regenerative braking would come in real hard and it would not allow you to go very fast down the other side of that hill. And at the same time, it's putting a little bit of energy back into your battery pack. That would be with the slowest plug. Now we skip all the way to the other end, to the fourth plug, which is what they call the freedom plug. With the freedom plug in there, that has the least amount of regenerative braking set and the highest flat ground, spe uh, uh, flat ground speed. So with that plug in there, when you come up to the top of the hill and you start going down the other side, it's going to allow you to go faster. Uh, it's not going to allow you to freewheel like a lot of people think. A lot of people think it allows you to freewheel. It actually doesn't. Because uh, of the four plugs, none of them get rid of all of the regenerative braking. It's just that the Freedom plug is the fastest one and with the least amount of regenerative braking. Uh, some people, it's so little that they can't tell that it's, that it's not freewheeling. They think it's freewheeling. So anyway, that's what the Freedom plug is. It's just a little plastic plug with a red wire on it. And it's only for, like I said, it's only for easy go PDS cars that are 36 volt. Now, number 20, I'm going to purchase the Novatis AC upgrade for my 2012 EasyGo TXT. Will this solenoid be okay? Well, I don't have the solenoid you were talking about, but I know this, that Novatis, uh, when they do the, when you do the Novatis upgrade, Novatis recommends, not only Novatis, even Alltrax recommends, do not use a stock solenoid. They want you to go with a more heavy duty solenoid. And I watched a video on the on Novatis uh, install the other day, and the the one that Novatis recommends is, is Curtis Albright. Curtis Albright solenoids are real heavy duty. I, I believe it's Curtis Albright 180 uh, is the number on the solenoid. Very very heavy duty, big bus bar solenoid, awesome solenoids for for high current and uh, uh, high speed and high current applications. So that that would be that would be what I would say is just go with one of those and just do not go with the stock. Let's see here. Looks like that's about it for the questions. Let me look over on Facebook and YouTube and see if anybody's over there. Looks like uh, we're good on Facebook. Let me see on YouTube. Uh, hello there, William Rizzo in the Florida Keys. I switched to lithium after three years of lead acid monthly watering. Let's see, I got three years out of my PNs only. Yeah, lithium is uh, definitely the way to go if, if, you can, uh, if you can do it. So I totally agree, William. If you can, if you can go lithium, do it. Let's see, that looks like about it for that. All right, let's see, before we go, let me give another, let me give a tip again. Uh, it's pretty cold outside, so get your plan together. We're, we're winter. Uh, keep your batteries charged. Get your plan together for charging your batteries, whatever your plan may be. You either need to get somebody to keep your batteries charged for you if you're not around, or you're going to have to come up with some kind of system that, like a, a Summit 2 charger or something that can that has a storage mode function to keep your batteries up. So don't forget, uh, don't don't let your batteries freeze up on you. Don't let your batteries get uh, too low and too weak. And the next time you go to your cart, it isn't going to work because it, it's not going to charge, or it's not going to run because your batteries are too low, or it's not going to charge because your batteries are too low. One or the other. So think about your plan and don't neglect your golf cart if you can remember it. All right, we will see everybody next week. Uh, the garage is now closed.